Hello and welcome to Streamers and Punches, the podcast from Sound Notion TV that looks at current events and new releases in the world of film music. My name is Bill Witham. And I'm Kevin Wilt. And today we're going to look at a few headlines, talk about uh, what's been going on lately in the world of film music, particularly with the Oscars coming up, and also look at a really cool project that Kevin and I were a part of that we couldn't really talk about until now. Now and we're happy to share it now, of course. So we'll get to that in just a moment. But first up, um, recently we had mentioned <clears throat> on our last podcast actually that uh, Bruce Broughton, Hollywood composer and friend of the show, had been nominated in a very interesting situation where it was a film that was very, very much not known called, I believe, Alone Yet Not Alone. Mm-hmm. And he had written a song for the film and he had emailed a few you sort of friends of his and just asked for their their consideration and to listen to the song and then he got a nomination for it and then as we noted in our last episode he almost outdid Hollywood at their own game and uh, and Hollywood was not pleased as a result apparently so it was in the news for quite a while but basically in the end his song was uh, rescinded or just yanked from consideration and so now uh, the five nominees are down to four for best song. And so unfortunately for Bruce Broughton, his song will not have a chance to win an Oscar. Um, thoughts, Kevin? Go. Uh, well, I mean, this this was kind of a big deal. This sort of thing doesn't happen very often. And there was, as soon as this was announced, it kind of you know blew up all over the internet, what have you. Um, it's... Did you sign the petition like I did? Uh, yeah. Um, there's a petition going around to to support Bruce and to support the song and the film and all that kind of stuff. You know, the whole situation is is pretty crappy. I think what it really seems like it came down to is like you were just saying, and like we said in our last show, um, that this this was not a big film that went through all the traditional marketing circles and and ad campaigns and things like that. So when it was nominated, a lot of people who did do all of those things and did spend all that money to market their films and their songs were, <coughs> excuse me, were, were um, kind of angry. And I think I'd even mentioned in our last show, there seemed to be um, uh, certain groups accusing the uh, accusing the song or this film of not meeting the marketing. Uh, requirements for the nomination that it had there were certain rules about how much marketing a film had to do in LA during a certain time to be considered and there's some people complaining that this film hadn't done that when it technically had um, so it, it just sort of seemed like that there were people looking for any excuse they could to to take down this song and unfortunately yeah. it seems like they were successful which is really a shame yeah, I think the the biggest tell was how much promotion and how much money is is channeled into the sort of marketing machine for nominations, and this was just one person who right. was just letting a few people know, um, and they are you know arguing on the principle that he had a former position of I believe member of the academy and also um, uh, I forget the exact description or the exact title, but. Um, a, a board member for the composers or the music branch of the academy, and therefore he was using that power, even though he's no longer in that position, to sway the votes of other people. And I don't think that's particularly true at all. Um, and so as a result, uh, so they did take away the nomination. And it's the first time in quite a while that that's happened. And most of the previous examples were for movies from like the 30s and the 40s that no one even knows anymore and or and or really cares about so it was kind of a big deal but yeah there was all all sorts of you know hubbub over the interwebs about it and so um it there was a big line drawn in the sand and i think most people stood on the side of bruce in the yeah sand I, with I, him. So. It, it seemed to very quickly take the shape of of a david versus goliath kind of thing and that this was this was a case of the little guy getting picked on um and I think that that sort of resonated with a lot of people, and, and like like you had mentioned, there are there are online petitions and things like that, um, and there has been, you know, a, a fair amount of you know, 
bad publicity, I guess, for for the Academy for doing this. Is it enough to for them to change their mind and reverse the decision that they reversed? Probably not, which is too bad. Um, it, it's like, like I said, it's it. This is really kind of a crappy situation. Um, you know, Bill, you'd mentioned that, you know, Bruce was the, the first guest we ever had on the show and really nice guy and a really great and thoughtful composer. And this he's kind of the last person that you would hope something like this would happen to. But I thought you were going to say that he's been on the show. So, of course, we're completely biased in this. Well, I mean, I mean, that's support to Bruce. That's so not what you. I was going to say, but I mean, yeah, full disclosure, we he's been on our show and and so I would say we our, consider him a friend. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We we, right. we consider him a friend, so of course we're going to kind of back him. But I think even if those things weren't true, um yeah. He's it, it's still there's still something that that really really stinks about this whole situation. Yeah. Like yeah, I said, it seemed yeah. like there were people gunning for this film and this song with with any argument they could it, it, this was not this was not about um him emailing people members of the academy um uh, against the rules this was about people trying to find an excuse any excuse any rule violation to try and remove the song because he didn't he didn't play the game. The filmmakers for this yeah. film didn't play the typical Hollywood game of spending all the money and doing all the things you normally would do to try and get a nomination. And there were people that were pissed about that. Yeah. So as a, as an interesting coda to this whole event or this whole um, saga, the the song in question is now like very high or a lot higher on the what Christian charts, I think. So it's yeah. getting a yeah. lot this, more notoriety. This film has, has yeah. a bit of a, a uh, a Christian background to it, I guess, if you will. Um, so there, that that has actually kind of yeah. been a byproduct out of so it's uh, this. Got a lot more attention. Thing. Is it now? I've, if you guys can say, if maybe you haven't been following it in this regard, is it now? Has it become one of these like cause celebs of of the of the right? Is it something that Bill O'Reilly is saying? Is this is evidence of Christians in wanna, America being persecuted? Yeah, I don't want to say it's that strong, but there are definitely some Christian organizations that those and Hollywood I, I liberals. I don't have specific names off the top of my head, but there definitely have been some organizations coming out and saying that um, this is about you know Hollywood trying to knock down a Christian film, um, which you know it's I, I I don't really believe that if you know if if that's how they want to spin it and it kind of helps this cause then fine and you know like bill was saying one of the one of the byproducts of this whole situation is that based on this negative publicity alone um this song has started selling a lot of copies which is it's it's good that there's at least some silver lining to this whole debacle yeah um but yeah it, i personally i think it's kind of annoying that, are, that there are some political groups that are trying to spin this so that they can kind of take advantage of it, even though yeah. that doesn't seem to be what it's really about. But yeah, they want to further their own agenda. But I just hope in the end that Bruce gets another gig based on someone hearing this and saying, "I like that. Could you compose a song for my movie?" And we will have a marketing budget. You know, you'd hope Oscar. so. I mean, like we've said, you know, he's he's a he's a great composer. I mean, he has a lot more composition chops than a lot of other active people out there right now. Um, yeah. And, you know, the people who are smart enough to recognize that do. Yeah. Well, anyway, on, on a, I guess, I don't want to say a slightly positive note, because I think we did spin that positively near the end for Bruce. So um, I'm glad that it is getting the attention, uh, and he's getting a, a lot of the support. But I also, speaking of support, I did want to say for all the other fellow nominees, uh, so good luck for everyone else who is still nominated, that is, uh, good luck on March 2nd. For the Oscars for best song and for best score, but I mean seriously, uh, we know who it's going to be, right? I mean, for the, for the best song, could it be anything other than Frozen? No, it's got to be. Yeah, it's got to be. It's got to be that song. Pro, I mean, Frozen was num- the number one album on the Billboard 200, like yeah. of all albums, not yeah. just of kids' <laughs> cartoons, of all albums, right? 
how it seems like that's pretty much a foregone conclusion. Yeah, that's, okay. that's, that's a pretty I big heavy weight. you meant the best original score is a shoe-in. No, I don't know about the best original score, but for song, I mean... Right. Yeah. Well, okay. Okay, so maybe maybe it is uh, Let It Go from Frozen, but we shall find out. So good luck to all the nominees. Um, Do you guys have any picks? Like, oh, super, yeah. like Super Bowl pick kind of thing? This is This is your Super Bowl, right? Yeah, well, I, I mean, it kind of is. This is this is film mu- music nerd Super Bowl. It's true. Didn't we predict it last time? We we kind of we we did. Um, yeah, but I think I, you each picked like half of the field. I want Thomas Newman, but not not because of Saving Mr. Banks, just because he's created a lot of good brown, groundbreaking scores that have been imitated a lot and set the bar on a lot of styles and sounds. Yeah. So he should, he should have already won one by now. But kind of like Denzel Washington. It's best to just give him one for training day and have that count backwards. Right. Good work, Denzel. You've been making great movies for a long time. Here's an Oscar. Right. I think that's that's kind of what I said last show is that I was hoping it was going to be Thomas Newman for Saving Mr. Banks. But in reality, I think it's going to be um, the score for Gravity, I think, because that film seems to have more Gravity. momentum than, than most Gravity, you might say. Yeah, it ha- it has more weight. That's, that that movie has more serious weight. Yeah, some might even then, say than than the other films in the category. We talked about John. I, I think you mean he... Mass, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> now we switch from one type of nerd to another. No, yeah. anyway, um, versatile nerds. I don't. Anyway. Yeah, I don't think the. I mean, just it's John Williams for uh, the Book Thief and Stephen Price for Gravity, and um, William Butler and Owen Pallet for Her. Alexander Despla, De, sorry, Alexander Despla for Philomena, and then of course Saving Mr. Banks by Thomas Newman. Right. Uh, I don't think I don't have any strong feelings about her or Philomena one way or the other. But then again, I haven't had a chance to see all five movies and really be yeah. the best objective person in this situation. The I just know that John Williams is almost always nominated because of his name and the you know the quality of work. But that score isn't groundbreaking for him and. Uh, I, the movie did pretty badly, from what I understand. So it did. That kind of it leaves wasn't um, Mr. Banks. Yeah, so. I, I think you're right. Philomena the, is a very kind of small, subtle, intimate score, and yeah. generally speaking, the scores that are winning awards are tend to be more in your face and, and more noticeable, which is kind of why they get the attention for best score. Um, so that's a bit of an uphill battle, and like you mentioned, for John Williams and The Book Thief. I think there are a lot of people who aren't going to vote for John Williams just because he's already won so many times. But, the, but get like you John said, Williams negative bump. Exactly, exactly. But like you said, with with the book thief, this is a film that when it came out, um, it was supposed to be kind of this warm, dramatic period piece. But the reviews weren't great. It didn't do very well. Yeah. It hasn't been nominated for anything else other than for best score. Um, okay. So yeah, that yeah. And so mark my words. Ladies and gentlemen, listeners and viewers, I think that for a lot of reasons, Thomas Newman could get it, and not because he should and he's owed it. But I remember, I remember now what it was I said last time was that there's a lot of old people in the Academy, and all the music in Saving Mr. Banks is nostalgic because it hints back at Mary Poppins, which is music that Thomas Newman did not write, but he does quote it, and it is a big part of the movie. And so I think the nostalgia factor, and it is Disney, and if Disney wins Best Song for Frozen, then it could avalanche over to Best Score. Sorry, that was bad. Okay. This, this, I you're think you're working really your, hard. I think we've reached our pun limit for this episode. <laughs> <laughs> Only one way to find <laughs> where out. To go, where to go from there? Well, let's <laughs> let's just start at the bottom and work ourselves back up. Okay. All right. So anyway, good luck to all the nominees, and we'll see what happens. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, Kevin, you found this out. Michael Giacchino is going back to work on some music he previously composed for a film. Yeah, we, we've got a, a couple of stories that kind of fall into this category. The one you just mentioned, um, Disneyland is opening a Ratatouille ride, and as well as, I think, a Ratatouille restaurant, which to me sounds like a pretty brilliant thing. I would totally go there. Um, yeah. But they're having Michael Giacchino, who composed the score for the Ratatouille the movie, write some new music for the ride. Which is cool. And he's done some theme park stuff uh, before. 
he did um what, what's what was the name of the big star wars ride Ooh, uh, I mean, it used to be it. Star Tours a long time ago, but I don't think. I, I think no, I think it still might be that. But he okay. he wrote. I don't think it's Star Wars: The Ride. I don't think that's what it's called. No, I think you're right. I think it's Star Tours. But he wrote some music for that. Um, this this is going back maybe a couple of years. Yeah. Um, the other the other story to mention is um, speaking of composers, kind of returning to older film scores, is. Um, Bob Gale, one of the producer, or Bob Gale and Bob Zemeckis, the producers of. Back to the Future trilogy um, have decided to do a Back to the Future musical that will open in London, which is is, is cool. That there certainly have been a lot of um, movies and a lot of licenses and things like that that have been recently turned into Broadway musicals. Disney's been doing it for a long time. The the other big example that comes to mind is this train wreck of a Spider Man musical. Um, <laughs> The difference with this one, which makes this really cool, though, is that they're not just taking Back to the Future and turning it into a musical just so that they can kind of squeeze some money out of that that property. They're actually having Alan Silvestri write the music for this musical. Um, And he, of course, wrote the original scores for Back to the Future. So that for me, that makes this really cool. I'm excited about this this project. Yeah. I don't even remember reading too much about it, so I'll have to check for me, myself, and I. I'll have to check out the link and read more up on it. It sounds really cool. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, coming up more into modern day with film composing, uh, Hans Zimmer has a new competition that if you want to be considered for maybe joining um, his crew, you can uh, jump in. We'll have the link posted, but it's got Hans Zimmer posed like uh, Uncle Sam, like – Hans Zimmer wants you, and it has to do with uh, Bleeding Fingers is, a, is a, a, a group of composers that he has, or I believe, or a company, and it is, um, it's, they're called like the Score Core, so it's like his team of composers. Anyway, uh, you can take a, a, a short uh, lick that they've created and they've composed, and you can then remix it and then submit it on SoundCloud, and then if they like it, then maybe they'll get you. So, um so check out the link if you're interested in that. I mean, I might do that. I don't know. I didn't even have a chance to read over all the way, but it looked very doable. It's just do mostly it. created in the electronic realm. Uh, yeah. And then, and then uh, become rich and famous, and then you can be a guest on, on your own show. That's right. I'll come back and I'll, yeah. I, this is the place where it all started. Sure. Um, and then, of course, we would like to wish ASCAP happy 100th birthday. That's right. For for those of you who may not know, although if you're watching the show, you probably do know, uh, ASCAP is the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers. It is a performing rights organization. And basically what this type of organization does is makes sure that uh, composers, songwriters, publishers, when their music is performed live or, or used um, in another context, whether in a case like this, used in a film or in TV or something like that, that the creators of that music are um, paid royalties. They, they're, they, so they're able to earn money on, on the work that they created, um, which is an important thing. It, it's, this is how we composers are compensated for the work that we do when, when a piece of ours is performed or when a piece of ours um, is part of a sync license, which is how music is um, – licensed to be used in a film. Uh, so these these are important things, and, and luckily they've been around for 100 years, so happy birthday to ASCAP. Yeah, there's been some good follow-up stories on NPR where they talk about um, the meeting between Puccini and Victor Herbert and how they're having lunch, and one of them uh, heard the, the band in the restaurant start to play one of their songs, and they got upset, and the other said, well, you should you know, get royalties for that. And the other sure. one, the other one went out that day and, and I believe it was Victor Herbert who did not have representation. So he went out that day and, and grabbed, uh, John Philip Sousa and one other prominent American composer. And they just formed it like right then. So that was a hundred years ago. Anyway, it's nice to put some perspective on it. It's very cool. Yeah. Um, and then last but not least, Kevin and I, uh, have been involved in this project uh, several months back, or several episodes back, we showcased the full score to Edward Scissorhands, 
uh, composed by Danny Elfman, and it was notated by a Hollywood orchestrator named Tim Rodier. And um, it was a, a real nice volume, and I purchased it right away. So did Kevin, and yep. I love the fact that it was unprecedented. It was a full score, uh, other than, say, classical composers like Copeland or Prokofiev, who've done film scores. It's very hard to get Hollywood film composers and right. their fully realized orchestrated scores on paper, in print, purchasable, and affordable. Right. And, there, there are a uh, lot of medleys and suites and arrangements and stuff yeah. like that, but... Finding the the complete published score for an entire film is pretty much unheard of. Yeah, and uh, the studios own the music. The composers don't. So it's also very hard to get the rights to it. And so Tim released it, and uh, I uh, let him know that it was a great project and uh, that I would be purchasing more of them. And then I asked what was instantly on my mind, which was, when are you going to do Batman? So, uh, well, he did. That was the next project that he did. And Kevin and I were fortunate enough to be a part of it, and we both got to engrave a few of the cues that go into the film. And if I'm not mistaken, it's 51 really large cues. Most of them are really amazingly large. Full orchestra, an amazingly yeah. large percussion section. It's a lot of music. It's a, it's uh, a big book. Yeah, yeah, Kevin. It's, it's hefty. It. So, and you it's can see it a, here. A this really is a nice book that... Shiny black cover. Yeah, so there you see the lovely Batman cover, Danny Elfman. But this is – it's a big honking book. It's its almost how, how almost is, 400 pages. And how much is it? Uh, it's going right now for I think $85. Um, well, Where at? Well, it's, it's – you can find it on um, the website for Omni Music Publishing, which might just be – Omnimusic.com. I actually don't know offhand. Let's see if it's no, in- no. You're correct. It's Omnimusicpublishing.com. We'll have the link at our site, there like we go. always do. Uh, you can see yeah. it kind of there in the book. Temporarily Om- out of stock. People like Tem- this. Temporarily out of stock on opening day, David. Today yeah. is the day Trump's as day. we're recording. No. Is day one? No, no, no. This no. was last oh. week. It sold no. out. It sold out on the first day. Wow. It's so fantastic. they're putting in a uh, they're putting in a second printing. So um, like I'm telling you know the library where I work, go get a copy when they come out with the second printing. Um, but anyway, I've you know I've looked over it. it's it's beautifully I mean put together. Just it looks fantastic. It's really yeah. easy to read, and no matter how large the orchestra gets, Tim did a fantastic job with the layout and just it just looks gorgeous. It's everything spaced out so nice and. It's very cool growing up studying Dover scores for me personally and looking at Tchaikovsky and Mahler and Richard Strauss. It's so cool to be a part of like composers that are writing and having huge music and lots of instruments play, but it's music written within the last 25 years, but it still needs a nice score and a nice execution, and it's nice to have done that and be a part of it. So yeah. very cool, very cool. Uh, so We're, we're uh, certainly both hoping that Tim does more of these because this is – for, to to get, like we we're saying to buy a complete published score for a film, this is one of those shut up and take my money kinds of situations. Like <laughs> it kind Tim, of it almost doesn't like, matter what the score is because it gives Omni you an entire Publish film score to study. Is like Omni Publishing is like the Apple of music scores. That's right. That's right. Just let me know when the next one's coming out, and I will give you my money. Yes, please tell me what I want, and yes. I will purchase it. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, so, um, no, great job, Tim, and thanks for, again for letting us be a part of it. And for the listeners out there, if you want it, it's 85 which is a, a really decent price for what it is. And oh, yeah. the hurdles it had to get through just to be published. So it's awesome. Anyway, um, all right. So, Kevin, let me ask you first what you've been listening to, and then I'll... Sure. Um, you know, for me, the most recent thing which has just been broadcast here in the U.S. is Series 3 of Sherlock. Um, with music by David Arnold and Michael Price, who we've had on the show. Um, it's the, the, yeah. the music throughout the different series has been you know, very <laughs> consistent and it works really well. Um, this particular series was, was no different. The thing, one of the things that I really like about the work that Michael and David are doing with these scores is there are, you know, this is Sherlock Holmes. So there are so many kind of surprises and mysterious things going on in these episodes. And the music is kind of kind of right there in, in a very traditional scoring sense that, okay, this 
this character has this particular theme and, and maybe shows up when there's some sort of association that maybe isn't quite as obvious in the beginning. So it just it's some, you know, really top notch television scoring. Um, well, and just top notch television making uh, across the board. Uh, very much worth worth checking out. Okay. All right. Um, not much on my end. Um, it does appear that I had a, um, a festival of movies starring Dwayne Johnson, otherwise known as The Rock, but it did. It, that's not how it had started out. But I did ha- catch GI Joe Retaliation. Um, I I want to say like I lost a bet, and that's why. But that's just simply not true. Which I'm <laughs> more ashamed of, but. Uh, and it's then like, did the by. batteries run out on your remote, and that was just on that channel or something? It was. That's exactly. Yes, that was it. I mean, that is and, exactly. And it was also like a, a Clockwork Orange situation where you also couldn't get out of your chair, and <laughs> your <laughs> eyelids were like pasted open, <laughs> and like there had to be a pretty bizarre situation were for you this. Guys there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's exactly how it went down. Anyway, uh, GI Joe Retaliation was actually sort of entertaining, and. Uh, all I can say is like ninjas on the sides of mountains. That was above and beyond a lot cooler than but I. We're gonna have to let you go. I'm sorry, ninjas <laughs> on the nice. sides of mountains. Hey, nice. I gotta cross that off of my movie pitch idea because obviously now it's already yeah. been done. So it, you should, you should. Um, but uh, Henry Jackson did the score for that, and I kept listening to parts of it. And I was like, yeah, th- like the movie itself. It is just a t. It's just a toy that they turned into a movie like Transformers, that should should be kind of like middle grade and below on the quality and I was watching it and there were just lots of little things that like well this is slightly better than I would have thought and the music in turn had moments where I was like well this is much better um, much more well executed and much um, better in the way it's conceived and then then would just be like um, another movie maybe of this caliber I thought it was slightly better than what I would have gone in expecting so that was nice um, I also caught, again, a second movie starring The Rock called Pain and Gain, uh, which is a Michael Bay joint. <laughs> and <laughs> it was um, actually, and I've, I've made it, and to be honest, I haven't made it all the way through yet because I had like work and life I had to get back to. But um, it's very much, uh, you know, for those of the attention deficit persuasion. But uh, it's a, a score by Steve Jablonski, and it's actually quite a bit more electronic, like more out and out, just electronic, like kind of like 80 cents and just really kind of embracing that sort of crazy um, sound world, um, much more so than say like Transformer movies that Steve Jablonski does, which is sort of the orchestra acting like it's a big synth generator um, with synths mixed in. This is just more out and out, like you're getting electronic sounds and electric guitar and kind of sounding like something for the 80s or 90s, which is the the time period for the true story at which the movie's based around. So not anything like ultra fantastic that I've seen lately, but um, a couple things sort of worth at least saying that I saw them. And so that's it. However, maybe on a slightly better note, there are some new releases of older films that do have like um, m- maybe more memorable scores as far as themes. Uh, the first up is In Country by James Horner, um, a lesser known movie of his from 1989, but it did star Bruce Willis and does have kind of a, uh, well, very typical James Horner sound, kind of like Field of Dreams or even um, uh, uh, Courage Under Fire. It's sort of a wartime film and sort of has those kind of themes. Um, anyway, I won't describe the rest of these. I'll just simply name them. But Delirious, a John Candy movie with Cliff Eidelman. Necessary Roughness, the football movie uh, scored by Bill Conti of Rocky fame. Meteor is scored by Lawrence Rosenthal. Uh, Monuments Men, which is out in theaters right now, is scored by Alexander Desplat. Uh, the Superman the Animated Series 4-CD set is out now with music by Christopher Carter, Michael, M- I think, McCoust- McCoustian? Uh, if that's how you say it correctly. Lolita Ritmanis and Shirley Walker. And then uh, Robocop, which is also coming to theaters this weekend with a score, unfortunately not by Basil Polidorus as in the original, but by Pedro Bronfman. And so I'll give Pedro the benefit of the doubt. That is if I go see Robocop, and I'm not sure if I'll make it out this weekend. But um, that's uh, that's all for uh, what's coming out. Kevin, anything else you want to mention? No, that's a lot of stuff. You know, we've talked a little bit in the past about some of these releases of these DC 
Warner Brothers uh, animated show soundtracks. There have been a couple different editions or a couple different um, sets of the Shirley Walker music from the Batman the Animated Series. And then not too long ago, we talked about music from the Green Lantern series. Um, so it's it's kind of nice to be getting all of this TV superhero mm-hmm. music available. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, well, like we mentioned before, um, good luck for the upcoming Oscar nominees. Our next episode will be after the Oscars. So um, that will do it for this week's episode of Streamers and Punches. You can listen to us on soundnotion.tv slash SAP, where you can subscribe to our show, leave comments, and find links to the music we spoke about. You can also subscribe to the show through iTunes. So my name is Bill Witham. And I am Kevin Wilt. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.